Okay, Zdrava and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sara Kastratovic and I'm the South Florida representative for UMD's Young Leaders program called Generation M. I was born and raised in Skopje, Macedonia, and then when I was 16, I moved to Idaho to live with my aunt and uncle. And then I started my college education here in Fort Lauderdale at the College of Nova Southeastern University, and I'm currently studying business. Before I introduce our guest speaker today, I want to share that this year UMD and Generation M have actually hosted 65 virtual gatherings, which have gathered over 400,000 views. While COVID stopped us from doing physical events, we have tried and kept doing as many events so we can unite Macedonians and friends of Macedonia worldwide. Tonight's event called but where are you really from? Second generation immigrant identity is something many of us I know are truly interested in. And I'm honored and grateful to be the host and moderator tonight. Our guest speaker, Dr. Natasha Garrett, serves on the Global UMD Board of Directors. She moved from Macedonia to the United States when she was in college and is currently working in their international education at La Roche University, which is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She also writes essays and poetry as well as translates. In her academic and personal writing, she explores the experiences of contemporary migrants and the impact on family and society. In her latest collection of personal essays, Motherlands, which you can find on Amazon, she writes about different aspects of immigration and how they shape our understanding of the modern world. So hello, Natasha, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. And I'm really happy to see some familiar names and faces and uh, maybe some new friends. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, you know, uh, quickly tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm interested in this topic. Uh, I came to the States as a college student, never really planned on staying more than, you know, three or four years and 27 years later, I'm still here. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always kind of fascinated by the way people react every time I talk to somebody. I mean, we could be talking quantum physics or philosophy, but as soon as they detect the accent, people will stop and they raise their voice and they'll say, so where are you from? Uh, you know, the expectation is that uh, if you're not from the United States that you don't understand or you can't comprehend some com complex contact. So at first I was really irritated by it because, uh, you know, I always felt like I don't want to constantly be reduced to my national identity or where I'm from, you know, that was, and people would, would introduce me, you know, this is Natasha, she's from Macedonia, that kind of went together. Um, and I felt it was really reductive, you know, and, and, and kind of, um, you know, I, I always felt like there's more to me than my place of origin. Uh, but the longer I, I spend time, you know, living in the States, I, I realized that it's, it's a way for people to connect with you and you know it's a it's an icebreaker and they don't mean anything by it and I you know I kind of calm myself down uh, a little bit but uh, there's still you know people that would say well eh, you know nothing nothing is satisfying enough you know if I uh, when I'm when I'm in the states you know people will say oh she's from Macedonia you know like you're, you're not really from here even though you know, I have an American husband and a mortgage and a passport and, you know, I don't know what more I can, I can do <laughs> to, you know, be considered American. And of course, when I go home uh, in Macedonia, it's, it's always for a limited time. So even people that have known me all my life or, you know, uh, my relatives or, or whatever, they, they do not feel like I belong there any longer, right? So um, it's neither here nor there. But, you know, I'm, I'm talking tonight about second generation immigrants. And I don't know, Sarah, if I could share some of just a few slides that I have. Um, let me see. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talk about 
you know, first generation versus second generation. Uh, so first generation immigrants are the ones that have been born abroad uh, and they have come to the States or I don't know if we have people from Australia or Canada, uh, you know, that have come uh, to, the, to these countries uh, after, you know, after they were born. Well, second generations are the children of those people. You know, there's immigrants that have at least one foreign born parent. Uh, so really there is a distinction, you know, where you were born. Um, uh, so, you know, even if you were brought to the States or Canada or Australia as a child, the place where you were born seemed to make a difference in how you shape uh, your identity. Uh, I think having, you know, at least one foreign born, born parent, uh, maybe even more complicated than having two foreign born parents uh, because, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but then you have to negotiate with your spouse in terms of identity and language uh, in the house. Uh, and that can, can become a little, a little complicated. So why do we wanna talk about second generation immigrants? I think uh, from kind of societal standpoint, it's the largest growing group uh, in the States, but definitely, you know, I'm talking about Canada and Australia at the same time, who, nations of, of immigrants. Uh, according to the Census Bureau, one in five Americans was either born abroad or has a parent that was born abroad. Um, and I don't think we talk about it, you know, <laughs> enough uh, about these facts. So it, it's really, uh, you know, there's a need to better understand this, this kind of uh, the slice of society, this population and how it shapes our understanding uh, of, of our society. Um, but that's, you know, from a, from a personal standpoint, uh, you know, and how they, they shape their identity. Uh, six out of 10 second generation immigrants feel like they're typical Americans. You know, uh, they have been born in the United States. Uh, you know, English is close to first language as you can get. They don't feel uh, you know, like they're standing out. But I think, you know, the interesting portion is those four out of 10. And I think, <laughs> you know, sometimes they, uh, they get neglected. Uh, a lot of second generation immigrants are comfortable in their hybrid identity, their hyphenated identity, whether they're like Macedonian Americans or, I don't know, Mexican Americans, whatever. Um, so they, they, are okay with being more than one. You know, they're okay with, with, with going back and forth, um, which is not the case with, with first generation people who, you know, are usually uh, the, the ties are closer to the home country than, than second generation, of course. Uh, but a lot of second generation people uh, practice something called cultural eclecticism that means that, you know, culturally they pick and choose which part of their identity they're going to emphasize. Uh, and I'm guilty of it. I'm sure a lot of you are guilty of it as well. Um, for example, I know, I mean, I work with a, a number of international students, for example, and if they're late for class, they'll say, oh, it's Kenyan time. You know, we are always late, no big deal. Uh, so they're okay to emphasize, you know, the foreign part of their identity, but then in other occasions, for example, they may wear pajama bottoms to school, uh, which is what American kids wear, definitely not Kenyan kids or Macedonian kids. So they choose to be more American sometimes and maybe more Macedonian or whatever other times, um, which I think is the beauty of having a hyphenated identity, right? That you can pick and choose which, which aspects of your culture uh, you're likelier to, to emphasize. And this is definitely the case a lot more with second generation immigrants than with, with first generation. Uh, statistically, second generation kids are likely to be more successful than their parents uh, in terms of education, in terms of, uh, you know, professional uh, position, you know, the income, uh, all of those things but the success seemed to wane uh, in the next one or two generations. So third and fourth, they're becoming more Americanized, which means that, uh, you know, they're losing that kind of, uh, 
desire to be the best that you see in maybe first and second generation immigrants and you know they are more relaxed attitudes towards school I mean this is definitely true in the United States <laughs> you know I, uh, that that spirit that first and second generation uh, immigrants have of, of wanting to be the best wanting to be successful proving themselves to be worthy uh, kind of relaxes uh, in the next generation or two Second generation immigrants are also likelier to marry someone from a different ethnic group. Uh, they seem to uh, you know, be a little more open-minded than their parents and uh, have more liberal politics. Uh, I don't know if that's always the case. Uh, sometimes second generation immigrants can be more, can have more um, maybe strong patriotic or nationalistic feelings towards their home country. Mm maybe more so than uh, even their parents. But the struggle that, you know, these, uh, this group faces is, you know, either they're too ethnic or not ethnic enough. Um, and sometimes that comes from really pressure or expectation from the family, you know, that, you know, they, they're not ethnic enough for the family uh, because the family still wants to hold on to that you know, identity, uh, and for the society, they're you know maybe too ethnic because they'll always be Macedonian or Mexican or whatever uh, other minority. So that's kind of like a rough overview, you know, of the identity. Typically, uh, as I said, second generation immigrants uh, work towards integration. That means that they maintain a lot of their parents culture, you, you know, that it's their kind of mother culture, uh, but they can easily integrate into society because they were born in that society and they uh, speak the language and they are, they're, you know, socialized. Um, sometimes they, you know, take it a little a step further and they do full assimilation. That means that they reject their home uh, culture, uh, you know, that sometimes it's a reaction to maybe the parents insisting too much on it. And they're like, you know what, I'm American or I'm Canadian, enough of this. Uh, and it, it happens, but not, not very often. Or in the other direction would be separation when they do not participate in the main culture and they are really separated into their own uh, kind of cultural bubble. And that may, may happen. Uh, you know, sometimes with the Jewish community, for example. But those are like three ways that, you know, this group can uh, function within society. Um, likely, it's most likely that uh, this group will, will do full integration where they, they're comfortable, you know, going back and forth with, within their two or more uh, identities. Um, I wanna talk to you, you a little bit about language because language, you know, is such an important and visible uh, mark of culture, you know, and, and language is basically a lot of times what differentiates immigrants from other people, you know, sometimes it's, you know, either language fluency, sometimes it's accent. Uh, but just to give you a little, uh, a little, um, theoretical background, you know, this Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is, is, is says that you understand the world according to the language that you speak. Basically, the limitations in your language, uh, you know, the way the language is constructed provides you with a worldview uh, so that, uh, you know, you think and behave differently in a different language. Uh, and that's definitely true. I don't know how many of you uh, are bilingual. I'm sure a lot of you are bilingual, even trilingual. You are not the same person <laughs> in Macedonian versus in English. Uh, I was, uh, you know, every time I, I work on a translation, uh, those are some of the questions, you know, that come to my mind. For example, I am um, wondering, uh, as I'm doing a translation, is the translated piece the same as you know the original? Is it an interpretation of the original? Uh, what is the connection between you know the translation and the original? Um, 
And I often feel like immigrants live their life in translation because they have to translate themselves to the host culture, right? So, uh, but as you're translating yourself, are you, how true are you staying to, you, to your real self? Where is your real self? Um, and likely if you're speaking more than one language, you have more than one real self <laughs> because you're functioning in two or maybe three different systems. Um, and that's really, uh, you know, that can be really difficult sometimes uh, because you see, you know, there's just not, the concepts are differing in a different language. And the question I have for the audience, you know, can you think of some concepts in Macedonian or maybe other language that you're familiar with that don't exist in English? Or maybe some concepts in English that don't exist in another language? Uh, feel free to uh, either use the chat box or, you know, just let me know if you can think of any examples. I have a couple in my head. <laughs> Okay, I will start you off with one example that I have in mind. Like uh, in English, it's perfectly fine to say, I don't wanna talk about it, right? Uh, in Macedonian, I think it would be very strange if you're talking to a friend and they say, well, I really don't wanna to talk to you about it. They'll be like, what's, what's the matter? Why can't you talk about it? What's going on? You know, like it's not a culture that really values privacy or space. So they'll just, you know, the concept that you don't want to talk about it you know, is not there. Um, another example I can think of is, you know, like in English, you could say, oh, I need some space, you know, I don't know, maybe you're breaking up with someone, you'll say, I need, I need some space. Uh, it would be really silly to say that in Macedonian because they don't respect space, physical or as a concept, <laughs> you know, the culture is very collectivist. So to say that you need space, it, 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 it's it's really it's it's really weird. Um, so those are two examples I have in mind. You know how the language and how you use language, you know, really directs your behavior. You know, I have no problem in English saying like, oh, I need some space, or I don't want to talk about it. Nobody will think anything of it. If you, I mean, think about it. You don't have to, you know, sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, relationships in the family. You know, in English, it's aunt and uncle. Everybody's an aunt or uncle. Uh, but, you know, as we know in Macedonia, it's like, it's your mother's side, your father's side, the, the spouse of your aunt. You know, there's definitely, a, uh, you know, a, a, a certain framework and structure and that tells you how important those relationships are in Macedonian culture. Uh, in English, everyone's aunt and uncle, so it's very egalitarian, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, a casual way of saying sorry, right? Uh, even, I was thinking even like telling your kids you love them, like Americans do it all the time, like, you know, millions of times a day. I don't think that's something, you know, immigrant parents necessarily say to their children every day. I don't know. Uh, it's just uh, what I have observed. So, you know, it just gives you, uh, you know, gives you uh, an example of how the way you, you think and the way you observe the world really is framed by the language that you use, uh, basically. Um, so, you know, second, second generation immigrants, they don't really struggle with the host language because basically that's their, that's their 
language that they were born into, like English. Um, however, you know, the mother tongue seems to play a key part because sometimes parents may not teach their children their mother tongue or, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And that, that may really shape how they view themselves. You know, there's a lot of people that are culturally like Macedonian or Mexican or Puerto Rican, but they may not speak the language. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not a good Macedonian or a good Puerto Rican if you don't speak the language, but it does create a different dynamic because you may not be able then uh, to communicate with the grandparents, for example. I think one of the main uh, motivation why I had to make sure that my son speaks Macedonian is that so he can talk to uh, my parents uh, or his grandparents. So you're losing those you know, intergenerational relationships uh, if, if you don't maintain the language. Um, it is really hard to maintain the language, <laughs> you know, uh, especially uh, if, you know, my, my husband's American, like if, if both parents are not immigrants, it, it's really hard because then you're separating your child from the other parent, you know, and you're creating these pockets uh, even, even, even more. Uh, so it, it's definitely a challenge, you know, and you know, some people choose just not to deal with it, um, which is perfectly fine. But I wanted to point out, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this book, Where the Wild Things Are, yeah? Uh, so Maurice Sendak was inspired by his aunts and uncles who uh, did not speak English and they, you know, they were immigrants and they would come to his parents' tiny apartment in New York and they will, you know, like any aunts and uncles and grandparents, like pinch his cheeks and like squeeze him and hug him and like mess with him. And, but he felt like they were like, you know, like these creatures that were lost in the woods, you know, without their own language. <laughs> and that gave him the inspiration to write where the wild things are. So even though those were his, you know, closest relatives, he felt like they were, you know, from another planet and another species. They just could not, could not really connect. Um, so language can be tricky, you know, and I, uh, after, you know, a chat a little bit, I'd like to hear back from you, maybe how you deal with that. Uh, uh, you know, with second generation uh, immigrants or children and how they, uh, how they handle the language thing. And especially if, you know, with Macedonian, it's not just the language and then it's the alphabet, you know, and that becomes, uh, becomes tricky, especially if you live in an area where there aren't too many members of your own community, uh, then you, the only source of language becomes you. Uh, um, and that could be really difficult because, you know, that's not real. Your, your language is a live matter and it exists, you know, when more people speak it, if you're the only source, that could be really tough. And I also want to talk a little bit about travel. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, making regular trips, like having that sustained and regular connection with the home country helps immigrants, not just, you know, uh, second generation, but first generation immigrants, because I feel like if you don't go home for a long time, then, uh, you know, the concept of your home country and the concept of home becomes something that's idealized, you know, you think it's perfect, because you haven't seen it for a long time. And a lot of, I think a lot of definitely first generation immigrants have that, you know, they, uh, they idol, idolize the home country, that everything is better there, you know, and uh, maybe one day you'll go and maybe you'll retire there. But I think the best way to keep kind of your um, idealized world in check is to go visit. And, and, you know, then you have a more realistic picture that, oh, okay, like I love it, but it's not perfect. And maybe I love the States, but the States are not perfect. Uh, and kind of equalize your relationship uh, with both places. Because sometimes I feel 
like for a lot of people, the home country lives in their imagination of the last time they were there. And sometimes that may have been 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and it's not the same place anymore, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I think, you know, that uh, travel allows you uh, to reconceptualize your home, you know, uh, so that, you know, rather than thinking that you don't feel at home in Macedonia, for example, and you don't fully feel at home or people don't see you as fully being at home in United States or Canada or wherever you are, maybe you have more than one home, <laughs> you know, and kind of flip it. And instead of thinking you're not, you don't belong anywhere, maybe you belong everywhere. Um, and I think the, the gift of travel to that, you know, second generation immigrant uh, children or you know grandchildren is is to give them that freedom to create more than one home uh, which is really important uh, in kind of have a healthy uh, healthy way of, of of conceptualizing your own identity and where you belong and it's okay to give yourself permission to belong in more than one place uh, I think that's the key uh, a lot of the narrative of, of immigration is, you know, very dark and, you know, that people are suffering and people are away from home and people are separated from the loved ones. And that is all true. But also, I think, you know, that's more of a outdated vision of immigration. Uh, you know, people used to come to the States and never leave and change their names and, you know, didn't maintain their language. Uh, you know, but I think that melting pot mentality that everybody talks about, that's long gone. Uh, and right now we're thinking more of the United States as a salad bowl that you could see all the parts, right? Uh, so that, uh, you know, it's relatively easier to travel and a little less expensive and, you know, all the technology allows you to be connected. Uh, so that, you know, immigration can really be like a pendulum that you go back and forth. Uh, and it's not all... Uh, you know, nostalgia and separation uh, that really is, is more of a productive experience and, and a little more fulfilling, uh, you know, uh, that you can, you can bounce uh, around that hybrid identity. Uh, I'd like to hear from you uh, some questions that, you know, I have for you and I hope, uh, you know, feel free to speak, not just use the chat, uh, but, you know, pick any questions you want from uh, from the screen. You know, do you feel like Americans see you as American? Uh, and to what extent do you see yourself as American? Um, and do you think where you were born influences how you see yourself? And what does it mean to be American? You know, what does it mean to be Macedonian? <laughs> what 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 makes either one of those? Give it a second. I don't know. Uh, I can stop sharing the slides so we can maybe see more people on the screen or what do you think? Yeah. But keep those questions in mind and, uh, you know, let's start a conversation. We have a couple of people that wrote something in the chat if you want to read it. Sure. Um, V. Evans says, since my supposedly home country is under occupation, the only way I can maintain a connection is by promoting Macedonian in other ways. Traveling to Skopje or Bitola only gives me opportunity to use the Macedonian language. Um, and Verka says, I think it's important to recognize that being a first or second generation migrant is a positive in a sense of have the best of two languages, two cultures, and a certain identity with a strong other heritage. Uh, I agree. I feel like, uh, you know, it is really um, up to us to create the identity we want. And I, I really feel like it has come a time for immigrants to create a positive identity of themselves <laughs> uh, and embrace, you know, to have more than one angle to you, you know, and, and, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, Philip, I think everyone strives to be unique, even starting as a child, our Macedonian identity made that easy for us to stand out. 
That's really interesting because I always insisted on, you know, speaking Macedonian to my child and, you know, we would go to a playground and he'd be like, mom, can you please speak normal? We are among people. I don't want you to, uh, he, it really, like he was sensitive to being, you know, constantly separated. And then he started school uh, and all of a sudden he's like, oh, I'm Macedonian, you know where that is. Uh, it, you know, it become, it became cool to be Macedonian. Then he, you know, joined like a folk dance group. I never in a million years imagined that I would sit around in these like ethnic joints around Pittsburgh and listen to folk music. And, you know, it just wasn't my scene. But I think, you know, he found a way to balance, you know, that part of his heritage. After, you know, I gave up long time ago. Uh, and also he's of course American part of the heritage. So it, uh, it's true. Like if you, you know, I think most, most people will see it as a cool thing to have more than one heritage in you. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's how you, you know, the level of comfort that you have with it is a different thing. And sometimes parents may push it too much to a point that, you know, the child rebels, of course. Um, do you, do you think that Americans see you as American? How do you think Americans see you or Australians or Canadians? Yeah, it's hard to keep the language. I think the language is really difficult because if you don't have enough uh, people around you or you're not you know active in that language I remember last year was it last year two years ago I was giving an interview about education which is my profession uh, in Macedonian but I had to write out some of the main topics in Macedonian because that terminology, I just don't use it daily in, in my daily life. And I really had to stop and think how to translate, you know, my profession in Macedonian because I really don't function in Macedonian as, as far as uh, my work. Um, <laughs> Philip says, sometimes we don't want Americans or others to view us as Americans. Well, that's that, you know, cultural eclecticism where you pick and choose uh, what, um, you know, what part of your identity you want to emphasize, right? Uh, so sometimes, you know, you, uh, you may want to downplay your American part, yeah? Um, Rado, you don't want to be different or you want to be different? I don't think he knows I'm talking to him. <laughs> I think he's just typing a response. Oh, okay. You guys can talk to me. I'm like the only one talking to the screen. <laughs> um, can you unmute people, Meto or Sarah? People are muted, Sarah. Yeah, I'm trying to send them to unmute. Hey, Natasha. You're unmuted. I'm so, I'm totally unmuted. <laughs> now we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the question, the, the point I made was, I really have never made a point um, of, of of mentioning or or uh, having a conversation specifically starting around heritage or where and how um, you know where and how I originate, and as a result, I suppose it, it has never been a, um, a a major point of identity or contention or advantage in in at least in professional life. So it's been sort of easy to to slide back and forth between. You know, being Macedonian and being American, whenever 
the circumstances require it or or allow it. Um, it it's almost kind of like a superpower. It's 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 never been a problem. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> You never are asked, like I get asked all the time. Muted. Gerardo is muted. Oh, you go. Yeah. When I see his name, when I see his name, I think, aha, he's ethnic. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right, I, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You know, my my no, parents that's, are that's... first generation, but they gave me an American first name, Jim. No, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. They, uh, I, I don't um, specifically get get asked, and and that could be because of my looks. I I, I look like a I don't know like like somebody else. I don't look like a like an ethnic person. I look like a, like a like a redneck American, you know, big burly with beard and all of that. So I, I typically don't don't get asked, uh, you know, just just casually. But w when I do have a conversation with with somebody and they and they detect an accent. Somebody will say, "Hey, where, where, where are you really from?" And and I'll say, "From from Pittsburgh." And then they'll you know start being a a, a, a more uh, relevant conversation. And I'll say, "Well, I moved here when I was when I was when I, when I was 18. So I'm from Macedonia, but I'm not necessarily. I can't really say I'm Macedonian. I can't really say I'm 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 American. I'm I'm, I'm just from Pittsburgh. So it it, it kind of gets to be a conversation like that." Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I guess I'll say something that's, that's probably not, not popular, but I honestly don't take pride in either. I don't take, you know, any, any specific pride of saying I am Macedonian or I'm American. I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, trying not to, you know, align, so to speak myself with, with, you know, either identity. Um, for better or worse, that's been that's been good in my personal life. Whether that's that's the right thing to do or not, you know, as a you know to support the uh, the group identity, it's a different story. But um, personally, it's been it's been uh, you know quite good to essentially just flow versus identifying and then de-identifying every time I need to switch. So sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's that's really. Uh interesting because I, I think that it proves that there is no singular immigration experience. And I think uh, that's something that I've tried to address like in my research and in my writing that there's no one way to be an immigrant, <laughs> you know? So to expect that the whole group will act exactly the same is silly. You know, some people choose to do it their own way. And, you know, and I think every one of us has a different experience. RG uh, has an interesting question in the text. Uh, he was asking why certain generations uh, of Macedonians have, a, you know, more of a uh, assimilation experience, for example, uh, and then why maybe more recent immigrants tend to uh, either have a kind of dual identity or be more comfortable with Macedonian identity. And as I said, I think it has a lot to do with historically how immigration functioned in the United States. It used to be the melting pot, you know, that people come here and they want to forget the past and they want to be American. I think the, the sentiment was that, you know, you're in a new country, you get a new name, uh, you speak English and that's the way forward. That's the way to progress. Uh, and nowadays we value multiculturalism a little more and, you know, it's, it doesn't take, you know, two weeks on a boat to go to Macedonia, you can uh, go back and forth uh, a little easier and, and cheaply. So uh, there is, you know, there is that movement from being, uh, you know, assimilating to really being something called transnational. That means that you can move from one culture to another seamlessly without you know, uh, a lot of struggle. And uh, if I add yeah. there, just from an Australian experience, so in Australia, multiculturalism is um, very much advanced here. 
And so I think the experience for someone like myself who came out here as, as fairly young, preschool age, uh, we can sort of move seamlessly through being very much Australian because we grew up here, we went through the schooling system, but also um, pick up on our heritage and um, hence into our identity quite easily because it's not discouraged here. So we can, for instance, in my case, I've worked as a lawyer for many decades and I can, I can work through the corporate world quite easily as an Australian. And then when I come back to my community, I sort of fit in and I think my identity is then strengthened in that that context so it's um it's quite seamless and i think i agree with the other comments that have been said about identity being quite different for everyone and also quite different in the context of the country that we've migrated to i honestly think i mean america says that they're country of immigrants but i see like canada and australia to be a much more positive examples of how multiculturalism works um I was just reading, uh, uh, there's a, like the Huffington Post Canada has uh, this the chain of articles called Born and Bred that investigates these questions that we talk about like immigration, uh, immigrant identity, but uh, they don't even call them immigrants. You know, they call them new Canadians if, you immigrant, if you're an immigrant in Canada. And uh, even the language, I think, in America is very prohibitive. You're an illegal alien. You're a legal alien, you know. <laughs> uh, doesn't really give you confidence that, you know, you are wanted. Uh, but I see, you know, Australia and Canada being a, a, a much gentler, you know, with their, uh, I think, policy, but also I think, you know, the vibe in the society uh, is different. Um, I think the politics and the policies play a part because for someone like me having grown up here and um, having you know, some recollection of Macedonia, but not, not a lot, um, and the distance in the 60s and 70s in not going back so often um, to, to Macedonia and perhaps with parents who you know, grew up there through collectivization and socialism and the rest of it, not always having the positive experiences, um, but then still in terms of heritage and identity being very, very positive, but not positive in terms of the, you know, politics and the you know economics of the of, of where we're from um, and then growing up here and being having that ability to sort of cross over and say yeah I'm Australian I've grown up here I fit in quite well but I've got this other you know this other background this other heritage and then seeing the overlay of that onto my own children who were born here grown up here have only been back to Macedonia maybe once or twice but yet still having a really strong sense of identity in saying I am Australian but this is my background and being very very confident about it right I think I mean it's I do feel like travel is key um, you know because then it becomes real <laughs> yeah. uh, otherwise it's just you know your parents or your grandparents imaginary land you know <laughs> um, but uh, Jim, you, you, you brought up a good question about names, and I think that was uh, definitely, uh, you know, it's an interesting aspect because names, just like your language or your accent, and sometimes the color of your skin, you know, if you're an immigrant, really signals that you're not American, you know. Um, so. I would ask my friend Mishko, do some Americans call you Mishko? <laughs> Uh, honestly, before I came, I had a stereotype that I would have to change it. But uh, as I came here, few broken tongues, 10 years <laughs> after, people learn how to say Mishko. So it's really not that difficult. But to point back on the conversation, I am a proud Macedonian, American citizen, and I live in Miami. There's no problem with being two or three. You don't have to be stuck just to your... Um, uh, tribe. I love our Macedonian roots, but I'm also trying to integrate in the American society. And so we encourage our community too, because we live here, we study here, you want to be successful here. You have to understand the systems, you have to understand the culture, you have to understand a different approach. And it's good to have an accent. Then there's a follow up question Oh, where are you from? Oh, wow, right. in Macedonia. <laughs> and then the lecture starts. Okay, back once upon a time, yeah. there was a king. He came to America to find his princess. <laughs> I was I was at a party. Uh, this was I don't know a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm at a like a Christmas party, right? And oh. 
talking to this guy and he's like, oh, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from Macedonia. And he says, yeah. oh, don't lose the accent. And I yeah. said, oh, I don't really need it. I'm married, <laughs> you know, so. You know, and some um, people are really encouraging and you tell them I came from Macedonia. Oh, welcome to America. Be an asset to the <laughs> country, you know. Uh, but some people aren't, and it doesn't matter. You know, we can have, as you said, I I feel home here. I feel home when I go home. Everywhere is home. There's no nostalgia. It doesn't exist whatsoever. Um, and so you can find a way to take the good from our society, which is the family values, our work ethic, our love for families and friends, and uh, then take the good things from here, you know? Wait in line, don't cut the line, you know, less a little less corruption, so to say, live a little bit more abiding the laws, not like in Macedonia. So literally, we're actually fortunate to live in dual societies where we choose to pick the good things from both societies and kind of create our own uh, personality. I mean, even, you know, you even when I travel to Macedonia, like that first moment is culture shock when people oh. breathe down your neck in line. And I'm like, hey, I need my space, right? That's the American in me. I'm like, I would like to have my space now. Uh, but you're right. I think, you know, but the, the difference is that you can go home and you go home frequently probably. So it's not, you know, it's not this idealized perfect country. It's just the way it is. And uh you know, you, you have more uh, realistically. So names, yeah, Arado says, I name my son Jovan without regard to what his American counterparts would think or react. Do they call him Jovan or? <laughs> <laughs> so my husband wanted to name our son Russell because that's their family name. And I'm like, no, like they'll call him Russell in Macedonia. I can't have that. Like, which is, you know, sauerkraut. I'm like, we cannot have Russell. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's all neat, yeah. like no that's not gonna work uh so we named him oliver you know uh, oh. uh, uh natasha uh, i'm if you can't see my name it's um it's like kegla i just yeah. want to say something about names uh, i can just open my video so first of all hello i'm not macedonian uh, but I'm Turkish, and the names has been like have been a very a big struggle for me. Uh, when people look at my name, they're like, "How?" They don't even like when people meet me, they're like, "So hi." There's a pause. <laughs> yeah. Kegla or Carla or Kekela. So I need to really like say Chala. It's with a C with a dot. It's pronounced as C H A L A. I wanted to jump in because it's been. Uh, I think it depends on the context and who I am talking to. And Verica mentioned about how Australia context is different than the US. Here, I'm seeing that it, immigrants are welcome, yes, but may not be welcomed as much as Australia or even in Germany where it's more multicultural or supranational context. It's been a challenge for me to even when I was looking for a job. So I would really love to hear your thoughts about and everyone's thoughts here about how to negotiate that actually that context when your name looks so strange it's obvious that you're an immigrant and when you have an accent but don't look like you look American so that is kind of a weird combination that I'm negotiating and would love to hear your thoughts I mean what's there to there's nothing you can do about your name. I mean, I, you know, you can change it to Jennifer, like a lot of people, you know, just switch their names, but I, I don't think that's necessary. And I think you're giving, I think you're giving people the opportunity to, to rise, you know, to the occasion. Uh, I honestly don't think any employer worth your time would hesitate to talk to you or, you know, overlook your credentials because, of your name they may ask you if you need a visa or you know <laughs> that's a different issue like if you need visa sponsorship uh but i i honestly uh feel like given the chance people like to be educated and they you know they do respond to you as an authentic person uh because you can't be somebody else that you're not <laughs> be yourself everybody else is taken Right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Listen, let me give you an advice because I've interviewed, uh, interviewed thousands of people. People judge energy, not name, not last name. Uh, the average time you look at a resume is about eight seconds. So it's good if you have a written right, but, but your smile that you have and your energy is what makes or breaks the deal. So you're hired. Let me know when, when you're ready. I agree. I agree. I think, you know, you always just, the energy. Always. <laughs> always. It's the vibe. Um, I hope it was helpful for others too. Like, um, it's been, I'm looking at everyone's name. It's easy to pronounce, but it's been a challenge in some instances. So thank you for your encouraging words. If you thought of a nickname, you know, some, some ethnics will give themselves a nickname that's American sounding or, you know, Anglo sounding. I do have a Starbucks name, but. <laughs> um, CJ, your initials, CJ. <laughs> Uh, but I really, I refuse. And I'm seeing this more in Asian American community and my friends here, they, uh, they always have a new name and they refuse to use their name. And that's showing me a more, of a, more of a separation from their own culture. And I really do not want to move to that space. So I've been just trying to find to negotiate, so. So Philip had a comment that, you know, having a name foreign to Americans gives the opportunity to open a conversation where the name is from and further education on the identity. So that is, is true unless you really don't want to constantly educate people on the identity. And that's also okay, uh, you know, because I feel like as ethnic Macedonians or Turkish or wherever you are, you constantly act as an ambassador to your country. Uh, and I mean, for some people that's a burden that's too much to bear. You know, maybe I don't want to talk, like history is not my strong suit. I'm really not, you know, versed in it. And, you know, and people will keep asking me questions. And so, uh, you know, I just, uh, I feel like it's okay to limit your role as a cultural ambassador to your own country to the level you are comfortable with, you know, uh, and that's, uh, that you you can't educate the world. If you want to, that's fine. But <laughs> you know you. The first ten thousand people are difficult. Then it's easy. <laughs> then you have a script, <laughs> right? I have a question since yeah. I can't really relate on the name part of things. Since my name Sarah is pretty general, the only thing I modified is I say no H. You know how they like yeah. for no reason. I wanted to ask you if you think that our ethnic food plays a big role for the second generation and how they identify themselves. Because I know like when I have events, I always try to like put some Macedonian food and I've taken like my boyfriend many times to one of the Miami restaurants so he can like try our different types of food because I think it's much more different than what they have here. It better play a role because that's what I'm all about. Um, I feel like, you know, that's an easy way to be a cultural ambassador, actually. You know, those are some ways that I, I feel, you know, do create easy connections with people and people are, you know, curious about it and, it's, you know, not non-threatening or whatever. Um, as long as you keep an open mind, like I used to be angry when people constantly ask me, so what's in it? I'm like, just eat it, you know, put it on the bread and eat it, you know, and, uh, uh, but, you know, that's just, you know, the language I, I wasn't speaking, but uh, I've become a little more flexible and softer on it. Uh, yeah, I think food is a great way to to represent yourself and your culture. If, if again, if you want to, maybe, you know, uh, maybe you're not a good cook, <laughs> you know, maybe food's not your thing, but if it, if it is, then, then that's great. Uh, I, I always feel like, uh, you know, we, talk at home and you know I always say like if you're not in support of immigration then you have no business like eating tacos and drinking tequila you know all the good food and drinks you know come from immigrant cultures except maybe bourbon uh which is American but uh uh yeah that's that's a excellent way um you know to showcase your own culture to other people but especially for you know first and second generation immigrants you know uh just as a family, you know, uh, 
tradition or, or in family gatherings. Uh, food plays a great role. I think the most, I mean, ask anybody what they miss about their home country, they'll say food. They won't, you know, that's, or you're visiting and, you know, your parents will, well, my parents will ask me, what do you want to eat? I'm like, I'm coming at 3 a.m. I don't think I'm going to eat, but they have, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's just something, it's a, it's a love language, you know? And uh, I mean, I know even like during COVID, especially in the first, few months my mom and I will text and you know we don't constantly want to ask each other how you're doing or are you healthy we'll be like so what are you cooking you know so that becomes you know you know a, a replacement language for really how you're doing <laughs> how are things if you're cooking then you're okay <laughs> so unfortunately we're running out of time so I was going to ask you if you wanted to wrap it up with some final thoughts like something you haven't shared or just want to say it again well I, I I really uh you know I feel like it's really hard to think about identity in your own head and it's always good to talk to other people and see how they're experiencing it uh I think you know maybe a couple of conclusions is that you know as I said it's not a singular path you know and and people experience it different ways and people experience it experience immigration differently in different uh, parts of their life, you know, so I'm not the same person that I was 10 years ago, definitely not the same person that I was 20 years ago. Uh, I feel like the dynamic bef between first and second generation immigrants is really where the conflict lies, you know, sometimes uh, the family may pressure you know, the young ones to feel Macedonian or act Macedonian or, you know, be more or, but you can't. And I find that ironic because a lot of people moved here uh, or Australia or, you know, Canada for, you know, a, maybe a better life and better world and, you know, more open-minded, but then they complain when their kids are more open-minded or they do things that, you know, so uh, you have to, t you know, you have to take all of the that's offered in the package of immigration, not just what you want. Uh, so you can't insist your kids to act 100% Macedonian if they live in Australia or if they live in in, uh, in the United States. And I think, you know, the third con conclusion I think I come to is that uh, it's culture is fluid. You know, it's not something that's set in stone. You know, even uh, I feel like you know, what was considered Macedonian culture 20 years ago is not the same now because it's infiltrated by other influences all the time and cultures are always in conversation to one another. So like Mishko rather said, you know, it's, it's really healthy to have a fluid approach to it, uh, you know, and kind of check your assumptions from time to time because even what you think is Macedonian culture has changed while you're being stuck in it, you know, so. Uh, I think it's good to be, you know, to have that like flexibility intellectually to to move from one culture to the other and embrace two or three or more uh, cultures in your life. Thank you, Natasha, so much. This was truly an amazing presentation and discussion. And I would also like to thank everyone that joined us on Zoom as well as on our Facebook Live. And I want to remind you that next Tuesday, December 22nd, you can join the United Macedonia Diaspora and Finance is Personal for a timely discussion on the topic, Give Yourself the Gift of Emotional Resilience This Holiday and Beyond with our guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Yelena Kechmakovic, founder and director of Arlington DC Behavior Therapy Institute and it's going to be moderated by Elizabeth Naumovsky, who's a financial literacy advocate and host of Finances Personal and UMD Consul. I'm sorry, guys, my Macedonian accent and English are <laughs> having a race. And I also want to say that if you've enjoyed our virtual programs in 2020, please consider making a tax deductible donation and to support UMD's mission and youth programs before December 31st. Hopefully soon we will see each other in person. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, we at UMD and Generation M wish you happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, every holiday that's celebrated, happy everything. Thank you everybody, stay in touch.
बाय बाय बाय